Sponsored in part by the Dean of Students Office, Title III, and the Emerging Leaders Institute. And we like to invite you to uh, some other programming this month. We have the movie Harriet, which is on next Wednesday. And then this Friday, we have the Art of Rap, which will take place downstairs in the game room. So please come on out and enjoy those other programs. I'm very excited um, about our, our guest today. Um, I know you'll get a lot out of it. And just in my uh, talking this morning, I've gained so much. I'd like to welcome, um, there's members of the Alpha Alpha fraternity from the local area, well, Charlotte area. Uh, glad you guys came on up as our speaker is also a member of Alpha Alpha. <clears throat> Eric Christopher Webb, uh, he has a doctorate of divinity and he's a certified uh, life coach. He's a national black authors tour best-selling author and an empowerment and leadership strategist, and is also an award-winning journalist, poet, and educator. For nearly 30 years, this multi-talented writer and artist has infused his works with thought-provoking themes and powerful social change commentary, including his critically acclaimed love letters, death threats, and suicide notes, and the Phyllis Wheatley Book Award finalist for first fiction, The Garvey Protocol, inspired by true events. Called a gifted and visionary wordsmith by Essence Magazine, and recognized by the Washington Post for his work's ability to shake up the status quo. He has been featured in movies, music videos, commercials, and literary documentaries on HBO, BET's Weekend Evening with the Spoken Word, BET's Rap City, <laughs> that goes back, Rap City, okay, Video Jukebox, The Party Machine, Party Machine, The Learning Channel, Voices of America, and XM Radio, as well as open for the legendary poets such as Sonia Sanchez and the Last Poets, along with Grammy award-winning artists Jeffrey Osborne, jazz great Gene Karn, and actor Clifton Powell. In 2014, the Philadelphia Black Poetry Honors recognized him for lifetime achievement. As a veteran journalist and seasoned communication strategist, Dr. Webb has received numerous awards and honors and fellowships from the Associated Press, Ohio University's E.W. Scripps School of Journalism, the University of, Maryland, University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism, Harvard University, Howard University, and the Dow Jones News Fund. He is also listed in Who's Who Among Executives and Professionals, Who's Who Among Americans Teachers, Who's Who Among Writers, Editors, and Poets, Who's Who in Poetry, and Poets Encyclopedia, and the International Dictionary, a Directory of Distinguished Leadership and Outstanding Young Men of America. So he's a pretty uh, much a who's who kind of guy. Dr. Webb is a frequent panelist and speaker for institutions, companies, and conferences nationwide, serves as a managing principal of the Baltimore-based uh, Kefra Center for Expression and Social Change, and is an interim chief communications officer for the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, as well as the editor-in-chief for its official magazine, The Sphinx. Uh, he's going to share how he has the connection to this area, but I'll let him do that. So folks, let's put our hands together for Dr. Eric Webb. In Hampton, VA, I was after not guilty OJ. Antoine Sedwick is dead. Outside Hampton's Coliseum, does anyone call and see him hanging from playground monkey bars like strange fruit in Billy Southern trees? Police neglect failed to check blood on scene. Could mean murder. Murder excused like tars and myths on vines of racist intention. Oops, failed to mention. It ain't suicide when baggy jeans are pulled down around ankles and tattered t-shirts are telling tales of struggle and retribution. Sounds like execution. Patience, man, is a virtue. <laughs> man, I better white man said that. Because black people always waiting on something. Waiting on free cheese and butter and still can't make a sandwich. Waiting on a fat white man in red suit to bring gifts to the ghetto. Even waiting on our knees for a God that looks just like Michelangelo's uncle. Black folks playing a waiting game. Been waiting so long, we forgot we've been waiting for. 
In the 50s, we waited, waited to ride on the front of the bus. Now we can't wait to get to the back. Man, get out of my way, get out of my way. Sometimes I think we was born to wait. Mm-hmm. Shoot, even black hands are waiting, waiting to snatch chains and ropes off black necks. Only 400 years and 100 million lives too late. Because black folks are waiters, black folks are waiters, black folks are waiters, black folks are waiters. Black folks wait on buses, planes, and trains. We even wait while white education is messing with our brains. And we still wait on education. Wait in colleges, trade schools, pool halls, man, even bars. But mostly, we wait behind bars. You see, justice is blind, 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 blind. But wait, my color is braille. Why else are all those brothers in jail? Black folks playing a waiting game. Been waiting so long, we forgot what we were waiting for. Waiting for desegregation and liberation, and all we seem to be getting is a whole lot of assimilation. A bunch of go times waiting to skinny dip knuckles down, great big melting pot splash. And we ain't got a pot to piss in, and even that would have a Jim Crow sign on it. Getting flushed down, down, down. America's pulled by conservative factions. When all we ever waited for was a little affirmative action, a 40 acre and a mule bribe. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Oh, damn. And we waited. Waited while Malcolm X and Martin Luther King died. Cointel Pro, government assassination. Waited while Tamir Rice and Philando Castile died. White supremacy. Man, we even waited while 400 Tuskegee, Alabama sharecroppers died. The Tuskegee Simpson experiment. But you see, man, I ain't waiting to die. And oh no, I ain't dying to wait. Because see, I can't wait. I can't wait for tomorrow. Because man, I know my yesterday. And oh no, oh no, I can't wait to see. Because y'all, I've been blinded by lies. But most of all, y'all, I just can't wait. I can't wait for black people to stop waiting on other people. Because black people, we can't wait. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm somewhat of a poet. I say somewhat. Um, those are two of uh, some older poems I wrote some years ago. The first poem you heard was called American Snapshot. It dealt with the murder of Antoine Sedwick. Uh, HBO did a documentary some years ago called Death by Hanging, and it discussed that murder. It happened. Hours after the O.J. Simpson verdict came, and just as I described it, they wrote it a suicide, but his shirt was torn, the blood on his shirt, he was hanging from playground monkey bars, and his pants were pulled down around his ankles so he couldn't move his legs. So obviously, it was murder, but it was ruled a suicide. In any case, that was the first poem. The second poem, I did what's called Waiting Game. It's one of my signature pieces that I've done over the years. And it just deals with uh, basically uh, progress and whether we fight for progress, whether we labor for it, and others' efforts to say it's not time and our effort to push forward too. And, and the, the silly things that come with waiting. Uh, Brother Sims, and I call him my brother, he is my brother. He is not my brother by my fraternity, he is not my brother. He's a member of Phi Beta Sigma, I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, so we've known each other for several years. I was a student uh, when he was at uh, Lincoln University, originally at Lincoln University in admissions or student activities, I think it was. When I was a student, I was a freshman, so I've known Guy for years, so it's, it's great to be here in Bluefield. Uh, he mentioned that I have a connection to this place. I was a Washington News correspondent for Thompson Newspapers for several years during the Clinton administration. And I actually wrote four of my papers were in West Virginia. And one of my papers I wrote from Washington was the Daily Telegram. So I have been here to Bluefield some years ago. I was like, oh, he had his papers down there for some years. So it's good to be back. And so I thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I'd like to talk about my lecture. It's called Black Lash. Surviving, transcending the end of the new reconstruction era. So I gave you, I'm giving a definition for a word I'm, I've coined called blacklash. A hostile white response to black or African American political, social, or economic advances characterized by individual and or collective microaggressions, 
to domestic racial terrorism. Now, this is not a real definition. This is my term. This is what I choose to use. So the withdrawal of the last federal troops from the South in 1877 as part of the compromise to the settled dispute of 1876 presidential election represented the formal end of the Reconstruction period and also the efforts to establish racial equality rights for African Americans in the form of confederacy. Home rule was granted in the South and Jim Crow was established and white lynch mobs would kill thousands of African Americans over the next 70 year period. In 1964, June of 1964, James Cheney, an African American, fellow civil rights workers, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, both American Jews, were pulled over for allegedly speeding outside Philadelphia, Mississippi after they spoke with congregation members whose church had burned. They were escorted to a local jail and they were held for several hours, allowing time for law enforcement and others who were affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan to organize and plan for the release. As the three men left, they were followed, pulled over, uh, leaving Neshoba County. They were abducted, driven to another location, and shot at close range. Three men's bodies were then transported to an earthen dam where they were buried. That's one of the original uh, photos there. On June 7th, 1988, a 49-year-old African-American by the name of James Byrd Jr. accepted a ride from three white men, Sean Barry, 24, Lawrence Russell Brewer, 31, and John King, 23. Barry, who was driving, was acquainted with Byrd. They knew each other from the town of Jasper, Texas. However, Brewer and King were reportedly known white supremacists. According to reports, the three men took Byrd to a remote uh, county road off of town. Instead of taking him home, beat him severely, urinated on him, defecated on him, chained him by his ankles to the pickup truck before dragging him while alive for three miles. Brewer later claimed that Byrd's throat had been slashed by Barry before he was dragged. However, forensic evidence suggests that Byrd had been attempting to keep his head up while being dragged. And an autopsy su suggested that Byrd was still alive during much of the dragging. Byrd died about halfway along that route. Dragging his body hit a culvert, which had severed his head, skull. Anybody but he made, before that, he had maintained consciousness. The murders drove on for another mile and a half before dumping his torso in front of a black cemetery. Birds, bloody and mutilated remains littered over 81 locations. Those circle spots where different, where different parts of his body were found. America's troubled past is replete with stories of racist white citizens who have directly engaged in domestic terrorism against the black community, as well as those who have used laws, law enforcement, and a judicial system to not only intimidate, disenfranchise, and imprison African Americans, but to conspire to kill them as well as their allies. This is Rosewood, Florida. Home in Rosewood, Florida. If any of you have seen the movie Rosewood years ago, it documented that. This is Black Wall Street, Greenwood, Oklahoma. You know, after 9-11, they mentioned that it was the first time that airplanes had been used as a domestic terrorist attack against American citizens. People had to remind them that was false. They used crop duster airplanes and bombed the black community, burned it to the ground. And then they passed a law after all the black folks were gone and moved out. They passed a law that when, black, when the federal government was going to give them money to rebuild, um, the state government passed a law that said you couldn't build on scorched turf. So no black people could come back to the property. And then after they never came back for a few years, then those white residents that lived there, see, they lifted the law and they seized the property. So it's kind of interesting. During slavery and throughout the Jim Crow era in the South, every white person was able to stop an African-American and ask where they were going. These are some more terrorists, terrorism. In doing so, African-Americans were kept under control or in their place from white vantage point. And so now we've gone back to that notion of keeping African-Americans in their place. 
Now, Malcolm X said that of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. And so by African-Americans now are experiencing a backlash reminiscent of the era of the Reconstruction era when some 2,000 African-Americans held local, state, and even federal public office. Now, between 19, 1868 excuse me, and 1876, 14 black men served in the United States Senate, House of Representatives, and two black men, these gentlemen right here, served in the U.S. Senate. There's Hiram Revels and Blanche K. Bruce, both born in Mississippi and educated in the North. Immediately following, blacks faced a rise in racial violence, including lynching, to so-called race riots when racist white Democrats regained control. So uh, Rosewood was another thing that they termed it. I mean, not Rosewood, but Greenwood, Oklahoma, was another thing that they claimed as a race riot. It really was not. Um, with, with Greenwood and with Tulsa, Oklahoma, what had occurred was that a, um, a black elevator guy was holding the elevator. Uh, Woman, a young, younger white woman went into the elevator and she closes the door on him. He trips and falls in. He's trying to get back in the elevator because he's running the elevator. He trips and falls and falls to the ground. She screams and claims he raped her. The newspaper at the time played into all this and lied totally. The whole story was made up and fostered this huge story which caused. Black Wall Street to have Green, Greenwood, Oklahoma, and that sort of thing, and cause the town to be burned down. So that's talking, discussing that. Now, likewise, as a nation bid farewell to its black president, uh, Barack Obama, and the myth of a and the myth of a post-racial America. And see, as I'm mentioning, we they, they thought there was a post-racial America, or things were changing at the end of the Reconstruction, that were during the Reconstruction. And so after that changed. It's the same as now. It subsequently, America has subsequently embraced the Philly Veil racist black uh, make America great mantra, again, mantra of the Republican presidential successor, Donald J. Trump. His vitriol campaign and presidential rhetoric, as well as his subsequent social media tweets and media comments have encouraged not only a divisive racial environment, but a violently hostile one where African Americans are faced with a resurgence of similar racist and violent practices. And we're noting that today. Uh, one tweet here falsely claims that 81% of murdered whites are killed by blacks, when in actuality, that's the reverse of the truth. Uh, most people are killed by members of their own race because crime is motivated by proximity and opportunity. 84% of whites are actually killed by the whites, according to the U.S. Department of Justice statistics. Uh, in the Crime Statistics Bureau of San Francisco, that source that's cited there, um, who it's attributed to, doesn't even exist. So we have this fanning of the flames and the same kind of things that happened with that newspaper editor. Fanning racial flames, making up stories. Most notably, Trump re had repeatedly refused to distance himself from and disavowed David Duke, the alt right and white supremacist a leader, when they claimed he spoke for them or represented similar values. Um, additionally, when white supremacists sparked violence at Charlottesville, uh, Virginia rally, encountered protesters as some very fine people on. Both sides. This, however, was not the first time the White House had embraced or played apologist to white supremacists. In 1915, President Woodrow Wilson's White House played host to the D.W. Griffith's epic silent drama, Birth of a Nation. Birth of a nation in which the Ku Klux Klan was hailed as heroes at the end of the Reconstruction era when some Af 2,000 African Americans, oh, pardon me, when some 2,000 African Americans held local, state, and even federal public office. Wilson said that the film was like writing history with lightning. And so this is one of the scenes from Birth of a Nation. Uh, they depicted uh, all the African-American roles were played by white men in white face, and 
all African Americans were depicted as the villains. And after to to play that after the Civil War, black men went around and raped white women, and the Ku Klux Klan were hailed as heroes and came to the rescue of the virtuous white woman. So now the Jim Crow laws and the poll tax of old have now been replaced by voter identification laws, felony dis, uh, disenfranchised laws, and gerrymandering. Even worse now, the National Rifle Association and the American Legislative Exchange lobbying efforts between 2005 and 2011 to successfully push for stand your ground legislation in 22 states has also provided a virtual hunting license for average white citizens to kill African Americans with minimal to no consequences. In a previous NRA statement, they characterized the legislation as self-defense laws and a natural right that empowered lawful people to defend themselves and deters would-be murderers, rapists, and robbers. So notice the us against them. Interestingly, the perception that the NRA and the legislature promote is that those who pull and use their guns are lawful, law-abiding citizens, and those others are automatically criminals regardless of the circumstances, especially when the shooting victim is black. The acquittal of George Zimmerman for the murder of Trayvon Martin also supports that contention. Zimmerman stopped, confronted, and then murdered Martin as he walked home from a convenience store with a can of Arizona iced tea and a bag of Skittles. According to the Urban Institute's Race Justifiable Homicide and Stand Your Ground Laws, analysis of FBI Supplementary Homicide Report data, when white shooters kill black victims, the results, the resulting homicides are deemed justifiable 11 times more frequently when the shooter is black and the victim is white. In 2015, Corey Jones, this gentleman right here, African-American musician and a housing authority worker was shot multiple times and killed by a plainclothes police officer while waiting for his disabled car in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. The officer who, has been charged with the who had been charged with manslaughter attempted murder had attempted to claim a stand your ground defense, arguing that Jones hopped out of the SUV and immediately aimed a gun at him. A Palm Beach Circuit Court didn't believe him, however, and re but refused to dismiss the charges under the Stand Your Ground Law, considered one of the toughest in the country. The law grants immunity to anyone acting in self-defense and puts the burden of proof on the state. An appeals court upheld the lower court's finding, cleared the way for his trial. The officer was, who was convicted of manslaughter by culpable negligence and attempted first-degree murder was sentenced to 25 years in prison in April of last year. So that's justice, at least. In the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Marquise McLaughlin in Florida, the law allows law enforcement to establish or prove the facts in a case, not a judge or a jury. This is not how the process is meant to work. In July 2018, Marquise McLaughlin was shot and killed outside the Circle A Food Mart in Clear, Clearwater, Florida. When he was found, Another man, 48, Michael Drake, arguing with his girlfriend over the parking space which they had parked. She was waiting in the car while McLaughlin went into the store to buy something. When he returns, he sees Drake standing over his wife's car, arguing with his wife in the car with her child. I mean, his girlfriend, rather. McLaughlin shoves him back, then turns and noticeably walks away to get back to the car to get with his girlfriend. That's when Drake. Pulls a gun, no threat, not in danger, pulls a gun and shot him. Reportedly, months earlier, Draco had accosted and pulled his gun on yet another black man for parking in the same handicap space. With the McLaughlin shooting, Draco initially invoked the Stand Your Ground defense law, and the sheriff refused to charge him. A month later, however, the state prosecutor overruled that decision and decided to charge him with manslaughter. Last October, he was sentenced to 21 years, 20 years in prison. That case has spurred more debate over Florida Stand Your Ground law and led others to advocate against it. Now, across the country, law enforcement is also under increased scrutiny for recurring shootings of unarmed black men, especially since many of these incidents were caught on video and shared virally over social media. According to a Washington Post study in 2018, 
uh, while African Americans make up only 13% of the American population, they have been disproportionately killed by police officers under all circumstances since 2015. On the other hand, police killed less than half the number of unarmed blacks between 2015 and 2016. While the number dropped further from 38 to 17 in 2017, but the trend so far in 2018, 2019, showed no sign of decline. Now, in recent years, the nation has been faced with fringe racist terrorists like Dylan Roof here, who murdered nine African American worshipers at Charleston, at Charleston, South Carolina Church, 2015. Among those victims was the pastor of the church and the current state senator, Clementa C. Pickney. And in March of this year, John Crothers was charged, this gentleman right here, was charged with a white supremacist group for burning a black man alive in Rutherford, Tennessee. According to a report by Center for the Study of Hate and Extreme Crimes in general 2017, rose 12% over 2016 levels in, um, in 38 of the largest cities, while there were 1,039 hate crimes in the nation's 10 largest cities the highest in more than a decade. In September, the Department of Homeland Security named white supremacy as a domestic terrorist threat in the wake of the El Paso, Texas mass shooting, which took the lives of at least 22 people where nearly 4,000 DHS employees are based. Kind of a situation where chickens coming on the roost. They didn't make a move until their folks that work for DHS were possibly in danger of this terrorist threat because previously uh, civil rights groups and others had pressed and pressed about making that happen and, and it fell upon deaf ears. President Trump had been previously criticized for shutting down and defunding various DHS initiatives intended to curb the growing white nationalist domestic threat, terrorist threat. And also this month, and also this month, the Federal Bureau of Investigation finally moved white supremacist terrorism to the same threat level as ISIS, as you saw there. Still, closeted racists not only feel justified in their beliefs, but also protected and empowered to act without fear of repercussions or consequences. Now, no longer are the microaggressions of as black men feel when we walk by and the clicking of car door locks, that we hear those door locks click or as black pedestrians pass by, or deliberate omitting of black co-workers from important work emails, enough. Instead, they have adopted other passive aggressive tech tactics, but now with more deadly potential, dialing for death. Today, frivolous 911 calls are commonly leveraged against African Americans for alleged criminal activities while they are instead conducting normal, everyday tasks such as shopping, parking in their own garage, opening their own businesses, swimming at a community pool, working out at their gym, entering vacation rentals, barbecuing, selling water, meeting in a Starbucks, napping during a college study break or even babysitting. Last month, a Ball State University professor called the police on an African-American student because he refused to move seats. Basically what happened, the student arrived for his marketing class. His usual seat was taken. The professor suggested he move to an empty seat in the back, which he did, complied. Went right to the back, sat down, got his laptop out, plugged his laptop up, started working, started taking notes. But about a half an hour into the class, one of the students in the front of the classroom gets up and leaves. The professor immediately tells the other student, the black student, move to the front, move there. And the professor, and he asked him to move, and he, and he said, well, you know, why do I have to move? I'm already settled, I'm fine, you know. The professor reportedly demanded, either move your seat or I'll call the police. And that's what the professor did. Other students who came to the student's defense confirmed to police that the student was not being disruptive and did nothing wrong. Later, the professor sent an apology letter, no, apology email to the class. Didn't apologize to them in person. Apology email to the class and to the student who is considering legal action. Since then, students and faculty and, and others have joined in protest demanding the professor be fired, forced to retire, or disciplined. 
University officials just recently decided that he would not return for the remainder of the semester. But that's it. Also last month, a Detroit man who settled one racial discrimination lawsuit found himself in another and another after a bank refused to cash his settlement checks. He's got a racial discrimination settlement check in his hand. He goes to the Sante Thomas, went to TFC Bank in Livonia, a suburb of Detroit, to open a new savings account and deposit checks and then to cash another. The assistant branch manager said the checks had to be verified by the bank's computer software and started asking him how he got the money. He told her it was from a settlement, and then the manager walked away claiming she had to call the checks in since the computer verification system wasn't working that day. So she goes in the back, keeps him waiting for a little more time. The bank manager continues to stall, and it says, says the person who does the verification isn't present. And, but Mr. Thomas said, you know, well, I'll wait until they return. So he said he'd wait. And within minutes, he was face to face with two police officers with two others guarding the door. He explained the situation to the officers and he handed him them his lawyer's card. The lawyer gets on the phone and even faxes them the federal court complaint showing all the parties matched the check. And the bank still refused to Mr. Thomas's request and filed a police report for check fraud. He eventually took the checks to a Chase Bank branch where he opened a new account, deposited his money, which was all available within 12 hours. Now, I see more settlement checks in uh, Mr. Thomas's future, don't you? Now, and they're probably going to be direct deposit, I think. Now, the irony is, the irony is the bank's assistant manager was black. But that does not change the fact that the assumptions were based on race and possibly class and also stupidity. So why would someone call the police on someone for sleeping in a dorm room co common area? Or what makes someone call the police to say that, that, that someone doesn't belong there? Political commentator Jason Johnson was quoted in the Washington Post that calling the police is the epitome of the escalation and calling a pity maybe of escalation and calling the police on black people for non crimes is a step away from a tax funded beatdown, if not execution. In November 2014, Cleveland, Ohio, police received a 911 call, gunned down 12 year old Tamir Rice, who was playing on a playground with a BB gun. Within two seconds, two seconds of encountering him, and without even stopping their vehicle, the car still moving. The officer jumps out the car and shoots. Near Dayton, Ohio, a few months earlier, an African American father, John Crawford, visited a local Walmart to buy marshmallows, chocolate, and graham crackers to make s'mores for a family cookout. While shopping, he picked up an unpackaged BB pellet gun from the store's sporting goods section in an open, an open carry state. This is an open carry state. You can walk into the store and carry your rifle, carry your gun, whatever. No one is supposed to bother you. But he picks up a BB gun in the aisle, a toy, and is looking. A customer, Ronald Ritchie, calls the police and claims Crawford is carrying a loaded rifle and pointing it at people, including children, and causing a panic. That customer's wife even claims Crawford is acting very shady and that she travels around warning shoppers around about him, but no one later recalls ever seeing her doing that. Instead, Crawford was talking on a cell phone, carrying the BB gun at his side, not pointing a gun or threatening anyone as he looked at items on the shelf. When the police arrived, they went directly to Crawford and within mere seconds shot him twice before he even realized what was happening. He died soon after at the hospital. Conveniently, the customer changed his account with reporters and the police afterward, Crawford, claiming instead that he didn't say that the car pointed the gun at anybody, but he was waving it around. A surveillance video later contradicted uh, most of the customer's account and the wife's accounts. Could you uh, play the video? Oh. One more time. Yeah. 
There's John Crawford walking into Walmart. He's going to the aisle. He's on his cell phone, talking to his wife. I think he, he has the rifle. I said they not found. See him. See him again. There he is. I think he has a gun. BB gun. He has a BB gun. Not pointing at anyone. Has it in his hand. There's not a customer near him. No kids. Nobody paying him any mind. Just an hour. Stopping. Law enforcement enter. Talking on the phone. More time elapses. Again, no other customers. Here comes the Leave the Creek Police. Shot him. They claim they yelled something. Okay, you can stop that. So as you saw that everything was a lie. And again, why do you call the police on someone for shopping? What are you aiming for? So a grand jury declined to indict the two officers on criminal charges, but a judge later, later ruled that sufficient grounds existed to at least charge Ritchie with raising a false alarm, but a special prosecutor also declined to proceed as well. So no justice there. Surviving the moment and the dilemma of law enforcement. So while race-based bias from some law and law enforcement too remains a reality, other law enforcement officers who attempt to exercise law enforcement fairly often find themselves being exploited by bigots. So it's not that all police officers are racist, not the case, but to some extent they are being used. Some are being used willingly and some are being disused and exploited. So police have no way to know what calls are frivolous until they arrive. But once they do, the disrespect and frustration felt by those unfairly being harassed often becomes a self-fulfilling narrative and exacerbates the situation, especially when many police officers lack proper training, hold implicit biases toward African Americans, or have an us against them mentality. It's imperative as African Americans that you ensure that you have nothing in your hands or reach for anything until asked and do it slowly. The imperative is also to survive any encounter with police to lo and then to lawfully respond later on. Like many African Americans, our parents have all given us the talk. How many of us have had the talk? Our parents. You don't know what I'm talking about, the talk? The talk is where your parents openly share truths about racial biases that you're going to face and how you should act and respond and also not only respond, but how to not only navigate, but succeed and survive. And those are uncomfortable talks that, that most folks even think to have with your children. But that's done every day with African Americans. In 2017, Procter & Gamble aired the controversial commercial, The Talk, which replicated that. So here's what's recommended what's engaged by police. Some survival tips, as I call them. Ask permission. I know this seems absurd, but in a car stop, always has, ask specific permission to move or perform any action. This prevents the officer from alleging later on that you made a sudden move. I always do it. Whenever I'm stopped, I they say, they say, could you get your license and registration? 
Is it okay for me to reach for my license of registration now? Yeah. I'm going to reach for it now with my right hand. Is it okay to do that now? I've had officers look at me like I was crazy. Some understood exactly, and some, it made them feel even more comfortable. Some made them, it made them feel comfortable. Others were like, what are you doing? Because they don't understand, and I'm like, yeah, this is what I have to do to make sure I'm not killed. Ensure paperwork, and this is a good one, ensure paperwork is easily findable or in public view. Don't wait for the officer to approach your vehicle. Have your license and registration already sitting on the dashboard. Don't even have to ask, can I reach for it? If there, somebody's pulling you or somebody's following you and they pull you over, get it out immediately. Know where it is, grab it, throw it on the dash, and put your hands on the steering wheel. That eliminates the very dangerous task of reaching in your glove compartment. In some other videos I'm going to show you, you're going to see how African Americans are shot when they're following instructions and told to reach for their license and registration. Empty hands again. Many police officers already view encounters with others as dangerous. Be sure there is nothing in your hands, whether it's a car stop or any time else, be sure there's nothing in your hands that can be misconstrued as the weapon. As you know, they always say a cell phone is a gun. Be observant to document later. Immediately after the encounter, document the contact and everything that is remembered, including the badge number and any license plate on the police car. Do not ask the officer for his badge number because that antagonizes them. Just be observant. Because if you notice, if you've been in, in space with the police and been stopped, and I've been stopped and profile stopped on several occasions, even as a police reporter in the town of Warren, Ohio, and then when they stopped me and they realized who I was, I said, so there's a profile stop. What was I stopped for? Question them, and I said, well, you know the law requires if you're doing these stops, these random stops, you have to have a formula for these random stops. So what's your formula? Uh, 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 okay. So am I free to go, right? Okay, I'm going to go to the office. So even I, as a, a police reporter, encounter that. Do not argue. Never, never, never argue with police officers. You cannot win, especially as an African-American. I'm sorry, you will not. You cannot win, especially since many officers perceive arguing as threatening. And if it is a racist or frivolous stop, all you are providing is a legitimate reason or cause for arrest or jeopardize your life. Remain calm as possible. Anything that is construed as a threatening action increases danger and therefore should be avoided. Notify legal representation and report the incident. Once cleared of the incident, place two calls to your attorney or legal services. If you believe a police officer has acted inappropriately, call your local national organization of black law enforcement executives, noble chapter order or national office, and if doing so, it's recommended that a su call supervisor from that department to be contacted and file a formal complaint for professional standards. Do not try to argue. You cannot win. I, I, I can't stress this enough. But unfortunately, there are cases where one does everything right. Everything right, and the outcome still goes daily. Could you play that video? So listen closely to the dialogue. Continuously, he asked him, he pulled over, he had already pulled over, even the cop was behind him, he pulled over in the gas station, he's at the gas station. The officer pulls up behind him, 
He's getting out the car. And the officer says, I want to see your license and registration. He's like, huh? He's like, oh, okay. And he shouldn't see. He had enough cover. There was no reason. And then if you hear, and in, in, in also, he says, he says, why'd you put me here? You didn't have your seat belt on. You could go and go to YouTube and watch the whole video and get better quality sound. But yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting case. You can go back to the next slide. So Philando Castile, who I mentioned in my poem, who was also shot and killed after being asked for his license and proof of insurance before reaching for it, he involuntarily informed the officer he was carrying a firearm, which he was legally licensed for. He calmly said, sir, I have to tell you that I have a firearm on me. And before Castile completed the sentence, Officer Geronimo Yanez interrupted and calmly replied, okay. And the cop placed his hand on, the right, on his holster. The officer said, okay, don't reach for it. Then don't pull it out. Castile responded, I'm not pulling it out. Like he's talking to him, like, I'm not pulling it out. And his old girlfriend, his girlfriend's in the car, Diamond Reynolds, also said, he's not pulling it out. Yanez repeated, don't pull it out. As quickly as he quickly pulled out his own gun, extended it through the driver's hand. Reynolds screamed no. Yanez removed his left arm from the car and fired seven shots in the direction of Castile in rapid succession. Reynolds yelled, you just killed my boyfriend. Castile moaned and said, I wasn't reaching for it. Reynolds loudly said he wasn't reaching for it. Before she completed her sentence, Jeanette Yanez again screamed, don't pull it out. Reynolds responded he wasn't. Yanez yelled, don't move, F. So he was basically performing for his body cam. He was performing for his body cam. The camera could not in the, in the, in the, the camera could not see in the car. So don't don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. I'm not pulling. I'm not doing anything. It's like don't resist. I'm not resisting. You're beating me. That kind of situation. So seeking justice across the country, prosecutors, however, have failed to file charges against or to successfully prosecute police officers who have been shot who have shot or murdered unarmed black men and women time and time again, despite the existence of video evidence. It is important for community members to understand the significance of the U.S. Supreme Court case, Tennessee versus Garner and Graham versus Connor. The two, those two cases involve the use of deadly force for fleeing suspects and the use of excessive force. And they have a significant impact on what is classified as a criminal act by police. Until those uh, court cases get changed, officers will continue to have latitude in using their weapons in the way they do. So that's why it's always important not to engage police in an adversarial managed manner except in the courtroom. In October of 2018, a Chicago jury did and convicted Officer Jason Van Dyke of second degree murder and 16 counts of aggravated battery with a firearm and death of Laquan McDonald. It's Laquan McDonald, a black teenager who was carrying a knife but veering away from police. The shooting was captured widely on circulated dashboard cam video. Ultimately, uh, still that conviction represents a rare instance where victims received a real semblance of justice. I have the video, but we're not going not to show it in the interest of time. Ultimately, African-American victims and their families have been left with little red dress other than suing for wrongful death or intention, intentional infliction of uh, emotional distress when dealing with police killings and false 911 calls, agitation. In the case of Tamir Rice, uh, when a grand jury failed to indict the police officers involved in the city uh, of Cleveland, agreed to pay his family six million dollars. Prominent black activist Sean uh, King, however, has decided to target the prosecutors and officers uh, directly who fail to be to, to uh, who fail to seek justice. Uh, King co-founded a political action committee. Uh, which elected reform to affect elect reform-minded prosecutors at the county and city levels. The PAC also hopes to focus on electing sheriffs and judges. The group also will gauge how a district ca uh, attorney candidates track on various criminal justice issues compares with that of other current officers. In addition, King also established a subscription-based social, social justice news outlet called the North, North Star. If you're on Instagram and you see and you follow him on Instagram, you'll see a lot of his... Um, his news items, he's one of the individuals that brought 
a lot of the situations with all the shootings to bear into light that went viral. So King's efforts with the PAC or similar strategies may be gaining ground, but only future uh, election cycles and incidents that may uh, follow will reveal. In Ferguson, Missouri, Wesley Bell, a city councilman who promised to pursue criminal justice reform, soundly defeated seven-term prosecutor Bob McCullough in August 2018, receiving nearly 57% of the Democrat of the vote primary, making him a lock with, with, for office without a Republican challenger. The primary election largely focused on McCullough's failure to get a, an indictment against Darren Wilson, uh, the Ferguson officer who shot Michael Brown in 2014. The shooting triggered massive nationwide protests and gave birth to the Black Lives Movement. Subsequently, NFL Colin, uh, Colin Kaepernick, excuse me, silent, his silent protest, uh, kneeling on the national anthem. So viral social media shaming has also become a popular form of justice for African Americans who have been harassed. Social media posts, which include video, has identified and exposed individuals' bigoted actions and comments to the general public. But most importantly, their neighbors, employers, and customers, earning them the monikers, and here's some of them, Permit Patty, Pool Patrol Paula, Burrito Bob, Barbecue Becky, Coupon Carl, Shoplifting Steve, Airbnb Amy, Gift Shop Gail, and Driveway Dan. So these people have harassed Black folks that were going trying to check into their own Airbnb. Uh, one person, one, the little eight-year-old kid selling water, and so on and so forth. Allison Edel, also known as Permit Patty, who called the police on an eight-year-old African American girl for selling water on San Francisco sidewalk, had to resign as CEO of Treatwell Health. Um, a C Maury Matson, a CVS manager, he called the police on an African American woman for attempting to use a valid manufacturer's coupon which he claimed was fake, lost his job as well as withdrew as a candidate for a Chicago City Council. Last August, a Royal Oak, Michigan police officer um, resigned after viral video surfaced of him stopping and questioning a black man for 20 minutes when a white woman claimed he looked suspicious at her. Actually, the man was, uh, as the video plays, the man was attempting to park his car then walk into a restaurant for lunch. I was playing a little short portion of this. They used to call that reckless eyeballing in the 20s and 40s that a black man supposedly looked at a white woman. So I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move for the case of time. You stop it. Uh, you can stop. Go back to the slide. Thank you. Transcending the barrage. So beyond the harassment, the viral videos. Okay. Um, so let me just jump ahead. Well, how African Americans are dealing with it. This has caused all this. What kind of damage has this caused? A lot of this has caused what has been termed a form of PTSD. Uh, they call it psychological stress, race-based traumatic stress injury. And it results in serious psychological distress, physical health problems, depression, anxiety, binge drinking, eating disorders. So a lot of this has, has become an actual physical health problem where racism and microaggressions have become a serious health problem. So how do we deal with African Americans? We, we fight back in the ways that we do. We file lawsuits. We do viral videos and whatnot. And most of all, we, we talk to our friends. We communicate. We talk to anybody that will listen, that will let, that let, us, let us talk and let's hear us without being judgmental. And so that's how we get through. But the, be the one way that we know we have gotten through over the years, and I'm going to leave you with this, is the poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar best characterized how African Americans historically and generationally have dealt with trauma in his poem, We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human gal with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile. 
and mouth with mirrored subtleties. Why should the world be otherwise? And counting all our tears and sighs. Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile. Beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. We wear the mask. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I encourage you. Uh, I am the author of a few books. Um, my website is being revamped, but uh, you can find my books. Uh, they're listed on the website, um, wordsbyweb.com. You can find all my books on Amazon.com. Uh, here's some of my social media if you'd like to follow. Uh, again, I am a certified professional life coach. I uh, do a lot of inspirational speaking, mindset folks. I focus on mindset, wellness, and spirituality. I, I do voyage in to, I used to be a writer, a syndicated columnist on issues of African-American culture, race, and and other social issues. So when I get to speak on these things, um, I do. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So one more All right, so um, Eric will be here for a little while to, to chat it up with you. Thank you for coming out. Thank, thank you. you.